Hey guys, welcome to another essential tutorial. So today I'm going to be showing you how to create this excavator animation. And we're going to be using a few different pieces. We're going to first build our scene in 3ds Max. And I just found these free uh, 3D models from CG Trader, which I'm using in order to create this demo today. After that, I use TieFlow, and that's what I'm going to be using to set up our simulation for digging a hole, adding small details like our rocks, etc. Finally, I'll show you how to export everything into NVIDIA Omniverse Create, where we'll be rendering everything in real time. So getting started here, I just added a few keyframes onto this model here. And what was nice is that all the pivots and links were already set up, so it was pretty quick to add our keyframes and get some simple animation going. From there, I just created a quick tie preview so I could see how my animation would look once it was rendered out. So now that our animation is finished, let's first take our ground plane, or the ground area that you're going to be using, and I'm just going to simply duplicate it. I'm going to then convert it down to an edible poly. And now, this is where we want to find out roughly where the claw is going to intersect with the area of the ground. We're going to be dividing this model into two little pieces. So let's just grab an area of our mesh here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to scrub through our animation timeline. And what I'm looking for is to see exactly where this claw intersects with. Because the area that we want to grab has to cover that entire space. And what this is going to do is when we're creating our simulations, it'll just reduce the amount of export time and the amount of particles needed in order to create our animation. Once I figured that out, I just simply detached that mesh so that now we have two pieces, the surrounding area and then the hole. So let's also copy that whole piece because what we're going to be doing is creating a volume out of that. And what I mean by volume is that we're simply going to extrude this shape and we're going to give it some depth. What we can then do with this shape is we can use it as a guidance layer within TieFlow and convert it into voxels. Then we're simply just going to subtract from those voxels and that'll just allow us to dig our hole in the simulation. So I'm just roughly lining up the top of our mesh so that it matches exactly to our surrounding area. And then I'm going to add a symmetry modifier and weld the seams so that our mesh is airtight. So now that we have these two pieces, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the left view and using our animation as reference, I just want to see the rough depth at which the claw is going to go through the ground. And from there, I'm just going to make sure that our mesh roughly matches those dimensions because we don't want to go further than we need to, again, to save on memory and simulation time. So now we're ready to go ahead and create our first high flow simulation. I'm just simply going to add a birth voxels operator. And what this is going to do is it's going to birth particles in the shape of a reference object. So using that previous airtight mesh we just created, let's add it into our birth voxels sim. I'm then going to change our display port to geometry. And I'm just going to give all of our particle voxels a shape. So let's set it to the shape of cube. From there, we can play around with the scale. I'm just going to isolate it here so you can see the shape. And let's scale it up to something like 500. And then I'm going to change the voxel uh, dimensions down. I want to make a lot more resolution. And this means we're probably going to have to reduce our scale again. So actually, let's put it back to 100. So that looks like that has enough voxels in order to do our simulation. From here, I'm just going to add a surface test modifier. And what we're essentially doing is we're going to be testing for where the claw is hitting. Because each of those voxels are then going to delete themselves if they register a hit with that claw. So by setting the surface test to volume inside, and linking it to the next event where we have a delete particles operator, now anywhere where the claw hits one of these voxels, they will be deleted. You can see an issue here though, is that we have these islands that are being created and we don't want that. So in order to solve that, what I did is I duplicated the claw object and all I did was modify the geometry so that it would become airtight. So with this duplicated mesh here, I grabbed the inside polygons deleted them, and I also deleted some of these bevel edges as well. And then I just simply grabbed the open edges and bridged them together. Then let's set it as display as box and non-renderable, as this is only going to be used as a reference object in our TIEFLOW simulation. Then I'm going to remove it, and I'm going to add in that new mesh as a replacement. 
Now, as I scrub through our timeline, you can see that there are no more islands of voxels left behind. So that's all I had to do in order to create the TieFlow voxel sim. And what I did after that is I used TieMesher in order to create it as a blob mesh. And this is just going to mesh our entire TieFlow simulation as one object. And I didn't have to really change any of the settings after that. But the one problem now is that because it's blob meshed, it's actually going above our original surface and it stands out. In order to solve that, I put a tie conform modifier on top of our tie mesher. And by simply using the hole in the ground and the surrounding area mesh, it now squishes down or levels all of the blob mesh geometry to match our surface. And that's just going to allow it to be seamless in how it integrates with the surrounding area. So the remaining steps here in order to create the hole in the ground is I'm going to go back and I'm going to duplicate the original hole piece that we created. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I'm going to want to retopologize it. Now, I use this plugin called QuadriMesher, and it's by a company called Exocide. And what it allows you to do is retopologize the mesh of an input piece of geometry in a really clean way. Because there's so many triangles, and because I want the mesh to actually be more dense, you'll see that by doing it this way, we actually get a much better piece of geometry to use for our simulation. And the reason why is because we're going to use another tie conform here in order to squish it down to match our volume mesh. Okay, so now that we have our retopologized mesh, let's grab that outside edge, convert it to vertices, invert it using control I, and then shrinking it down. And then I'm gonna add a push modifier and just set it to something like 0 0.01. Finally, the last modifier I'm gonna add is another tie conform. From there, I'm gonna select our original tie mesher object and the surrounding area. And then the only thing I'm gonna change is I'm gonna set it to raycast and then I'm going to make sure that it uses the vertex selection. Now, the one problem you might notice, even though our UVs are transferred, is that there's still this ring around our object. And in order to fix that so that our textures match seamlessly, I'm going to add another edit poly modifier. Then I'm going to select all the vertices. And then I'm going to add one final tie conform on top of this. I'm going to move it up slightly so that when we tie conform down, it's not going to be adjacent, but on top of the original mesh, and so that it'll actually fix those UVs properly. And now, if I go and set it back to use vertex selection, and I transfer those UVs, you can see that our texture now matches seamlessly with the surrounding mesh. So that looks pretty good. I'm going to add a turbo smooth here. And that works pretty well. So just as a minor polish detail, you can see that the retopologized mesh actually smoothed out some of the edges, so they don't actually line up perfectly. So if you want to get nitpicky, one of the things you can do to clean that up is you can just simply add another edit poly modifier, and you can just drag in those vertices in order to make it seamless. From there, we can just re-enable the Turbo Smooth modifier, and then we're ready to move on to the next step. So now that we have the hole being dug, let's go and add one last tie flow simulation. Now, before I do that, I'm going to export our tie mesher object as an Alembic file. And the reason I'm doing that is that I'm going to need it for our next tie flow simulation. I'm going to leave all the settings the same, and then I'm simply just going to re-import that Alembic file. Again, leaving all the settings the same. Now, the only reason I'm doing this is that in our next tie flow simulation, if I don't have it baked down as an Alembic file, our simulation is going to be dramatically slower. So let's do a birth intersection, and I'm going to set the simulation end time and our threshold down to 5, and then I'm going to set our mode to A, B. Then I'm simply going to set our geometry A as the bucket, and then geometry B as that Alembic file that we just re-imported. Now under the shape layers, I'm going to add pebbles and stones. I'm just going to have two 3D shape layers for now. And I'm going to then play around with the scale parameters in order to add some variety. For now, let's just set our display operator to geometry. And then I'm going to scrub through the timeline to see what that did. You can see here now that anywhere where the bucket is intersecting with, 
it's going to create particles. Now, these particles all look pretty uniform, so as I mentioned previously, I want to play around with the scale variation in order to add a bit more realism. So just coming up to the scale parameter here, let's set it to 100 and our variation percentage down to 50. And I'm going to do the same thing for both shape layers. So let's also add a physics shape operator. And I'm going to leave it as convex hull. And then I'm going to add another operator here for physics collision. Now this is going to define what our collisions are going to be. And I want to set it for three different objects here. I want to set it for a bucket, for our surrounding mesh, and then I want to set it for our original Alembic file that we imported as well. And I'm going to set the hull type to mesh, which will make our collisions a lot more realistic. And then I want to set the interparticle collisions and the ground collider as well. So now you can see that as the bucket is intersecting with the ground, we're generating those particles, and those particles are realistically colliding with all of those different elements. So I'm going to go to my Materials tab by tapping M, and I'm going to apply the same ground material I used, and I'm going to apply it to our tie flow simulation. Now one thing I'm going to change is I'm going to add a mapping operator, and I'm going to have that mapping operator reference the UVs from another object. In this case, the original whole mesh that we had. And that's it. I'm not going to change any of the parameters. And now you can see that our rocks have inherited the original texture material of the ground, and it just blends seamlessly with our environment. So that concludes all the parts that we need for our tie flow simulation. Now that our scene is ready to render, I'm going to export all of our different pieces so that we can render it in real time with an NVIDIA Omniverse Create. First, selecting our outside surrounding area, I'm going to export it as an FBX. And I'm going to leave all of the settings the same. Now I'm also going to select the excavator, selecting all the different pieces of it. And I'm going to just isolate it here so you can see it. I'm going to export that also as an FBX. And I just want to make sure that our animation is enabled. And that's going to be oriented in the Y up position as well. For the third piece, I'm going to select the plane that was tie conformed to our tie mesh or object. And from here, I'm going to export it as an Alembic mesh as well, so that it carries all the deformation animation. So once again, I'm just going to export it into the same folder. And I'm going to leave all of the settings the same here for the Alembic file as well, just making sure that it's in the Y up orientation. Lastly, we're going to need our tie flow simulation. And in order to do that, I'm going to use an export operator. And I'm simply going to set it to Alembic Mesh. I'm going to make sure that it matches our timeline. And I'm just going to set the output folder to match all of the other pieces. Making sure that it's in the Y up orientation. And then just hit Generate Alembic File. So now that that part is done in 3ds Max, let's jump into NVIDIA Omniverse Create. I just wanted to show you guys a quick look at the behind the scenes project file that I used for the animation in this video. Now this project set up in NVIDIA Omniverse Create which is set up using those four layers. So by bringing in my FBX and Alembic files, I was able to add those in as sub-layers and then simply rebuild my shaders. Now what's so cool about this software is just how fast it renders things. I've shown it many times before, but it's just still so much fun to fly around and it's really quick to iterate upon your animations and find new camera angles. One thing I just wanted to mention was that the Alembic file that I exported was actually around 116 gigabytes. So it was actually slowing down my scene quite a bit. So you just want to be careful about how many particles you're using because it can definitely add to that file size in the end. Anyway, I highly recommend playing around with NVIDIA Omniverse Create. Combining it with things like TieFlow and 3ds Max, it's really cool and easy to visualize your animations and saves a ton of rendering time when you're putting together your projects. If you guys are interested, I put the project file up on my Patreon page so that you can download it and see just exactly how it works. Anyway, I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time.